Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining today's briefing on understanding the JRD's votes. My name is Odelia Mader. I am the Program Associate for Middle East Policy at the Friends Committee on National Legislation, and I'll be moderating today's panel. Co-hosting this briefing are our friends at Demand Progress, Center for Civilians in Conflict, or CIVIC, A New Policy, Policy and Amnesty International USA. Uh, in our last briefing in this series, we heard about UNRWA's work in Gaza, the West Bank, Lebanon, and the region, the consequences of U.S. funding suspension to UNRWA, as well as steps UNRWA has taken to ensure transparency and accountability. And we also took a deeper dive into the UNRWA Funding Emergency Restoration Act of 2024. If you're interested in seeing more, please see the link sent in the chat to hear what our panelists had to share. Over 400 days have passed since the October 7th Hamas attacks, which led to a new cycle of Israeli airstrikes, ground invasion, and ongoing military operations in Gaza. These operations, funded primarily by US weapons and financial support, began with the Israeli government's declared objectives of dismantling Hamas's military and governance structures, as well as securing the release of all hostages. A year and 36 days later, more hostages have been killed by Israeli military actions than have been freed, and over 2 million Palestinians in Gaza are facing what many are calling the world's worst man-made humanitarian disaster, marked by famine, disease outbreaks, and mass displacement. On October 13th, Secretaries Blinken and Austin sent a letter to their Israeli counterparts demanding Israel take steps within 30 days to improve humanitarian conditions in Gaza or risk the supply of U.S. weapons to Israel being affected. Today is the deadline for complying with the conditions outlined in the letter. While major humanitarian organizations are saying that Israel's actions failed to meet any of the specific criteria set out in the letter, and have even concurrently taken actions that dramatically worsen the situation on the ground, particularly in northern Gaza. A vote is expected next week on joint resolutions of disapproval to block certain offensive weapon sales to Israel. These resolutions were introduced on September 18th by Senator Sanders, along with Senators Welch, Merkley, and Schatz, following a U.S. administration announcement of over $20 billion in weapon sales. The bills are targeting a number of specific arms sales to Israel, including 120 millimeter tank shells and joint direct attack munitions, weapons that have been used in documented civilian harm. The bills do not implicate missile defense systems such as the Iron Dome and David Sling, while senators specifically did not file resolutions to block air defense technologies, including AMRAMs. In this briefing, our panel of experts will delve into the key aspects of these arms sales which arms are um, which arms are being targeted and their implications for civilian harm, the legal considerations under existing U.S. law and policies, and the broader geopolitical and humanitarian context surrounding this historic vote. After our panelists answer a couple of questions, we'll proceed to a Q&A section where we'll be addressing questions sent via our registration form. If you have further questions, please use the Q&A function in this Zoom and we will try to address them. So first we'll hear from Elizabeth Regebe, the Middle East and North Africa, Africa Advocacy Director for Amnesty International USA. In this role, she leads Amnesty USA's advocacy on human rights issues across the MENA region. Prior to this, she served as the Levant researcher with the Cairo Institute for Human Rights Studies based in Tunis, Tunisia. Elizabeth has conducted human rights advocacy on Palestine and Syria at the United Nations, the European Union, and before national governments in close collaboration with local civil society organizations. So Elizabeth, could you please, to start us off, walk us through Amnesty's research on the use of specific weapons implicated in these JRDs, um, such as JDAMs and the 120 millimeter uh, tank shells, and also um, what evidence has Amnesty gathered on how these weapons have impacted civilians in the occupied Gaza Strip and Lebanon. Thank you, Adilia. Um, yeah, so throughout this period, if we're talking, if we're strictly talking about uh, 
approximately the last 13 months, months, Amnesty has documented numerous violations of international humanitarian law and human rights law, um, as well as war crimes by Israeli forces in the occupied Palestinian territory and Lebanon. Um, with respect to the Gaza Strip in particular, Amnesty International is one of the only international human rights organizations with a presence on the ground. Um, much of the documentation that I'm going to go through in my answer is only possible due to the amazing work of our field worker in the occupied Gaza Strip um, who has carried out his work under um, unimaginable circumstances of, I think, not only doing his work, but trying to uh, ensure his and his family's survival. And so for more than a year, Amnesty's documented a pattern of unlawful attacks by Israeli forces that have struck civilians and civilian objects, both in the occupied Gaza Strip, um, and as well as a number of attacks in Lebanon. Um, with respect to the pattern that Amnesty's observed in the Gaza Strip over the last 13 months, um, while the scale and pace have been unprecedented, I did want to underscore that the overall pattern is consistent with the conduct of Israeli forces um, during the 2008 and 9, 2014 and 2021 conflicts in Gaza. Um, and as I mentioned, we've also uh, investigated and documented um, on a, a few different attacks within um, Lebanon during this same period. So taking a step back for a minute and kind of um, give a, I want to give a quick overview of um, Amnesty's investigations, and then I'm going to go through some of the, the specific cases. I do want to be clear, it's not meant to be completely exhaustive of Amnesty's investigations. And of course, what Amnesty's investigated only also represents a small portion of the information that is out there, both from other human rights organizations, um, some of the reporting even from humanitarian organizations, and of course, media outlets. So within Amnesty's investigations, um, Amnesty's identified U.S.-made munitions and or U.S.-made components in at least six cases out of the total 20 attacks that Amnesty has published findings on so far, both, and this includes cases from Gaza and Lebanon during this period. Uh, in these uh, cases, Amnesty has um, concluded that the attack amounted to a war crime. In other attacks, um, so beyond the, the six that identify US made munitions, either Amnesty was unable to conclusively identify the type or origin of the munition used, um, or identified that the munition um, had other origins that was non-US, so like Israeli made and so forth. Uh, so I want to start with some of the cases um, that we have of uh, joint attack, excuse me, joint attack direct munitions, JDAMs, um, as well as some cases of other guided bomb units, which are not JDAMs, but are also um, the kits that allow for precision guided attacks. So with respect to JDAMs specifically, um, Amnesty documented two deadly unlawful strikes by Israeli forces on homes full of Palestinian civilians um, that were either direct attacks on civilian objects or amounted to indiscriminate attacks. <clears throat> so the first case occurred on October 10th, 2023 at approximately 8.30 p.m. The strike hit a family home in Deir al-Balah. Uh, which killed 21 members of the An-Najjar family um, and three of their neighbors. Um, among those killed included seven children. Um, in this particular attack, um, Amnesty was able to uncover the shrapnel left behind by the weapon and identified it as a Boeing JDAM kit um, and that this kit was attached to a bomb that likely weighed 2,000 pounds in this case. On October 22nd, 2023, at approximately 12 p.m., an Israeli airstrike on the Abu, uh, sorry, Abu Mu'ayliq uh, home in the same city killed 18 members of the family, including 12 children, as well as a neighbor. Um, likewise, in this case, the shrapnel uncovered um, was of a Boeing JDAM kit, and Amnesty assessed that it was used with a bomb that likely weighed at least 1,000 pounds. In both of these cases, Amnesty International did not find any indication that there were any military objectives at the sites of these two strikes or that the people in the buildings uh, were legitimate targets. So in addition to these two cases, Amnesty has found other evidence of U.S.-made munitions in unlawful strikes. They may not be the um, direct subject of the JRDs, but I think relevant to showcasing the overall pattern of unlawful activity. Um, so in another case, this one is from January 9th of this year, 
just before 11 p.m. at night, um, an Israeli airstrike hit the top two floors of the Nofal family five-story building. Uh, this occurred in Tal Sultan in Rafah. Uh, this is an area to which the Israeli military had repeatedly ordered the displaced to, to flee for safety. Uh, and this attack killed 18 civilians, including 10 children, and wounded at least eight others. From the fragments um, discovered at the site, Amnesty identified a U.S.-made Boeing uh, guided bomb unit, specifically a GBU-39 small diameter bomb. <clears throat> As with the other attacks that, uh, attacks that I just mentioned, uh, Israeli authorities did not give a reason for the strike, and Amnesty um, reviewed a list of the names of all of those staying on the targeted floors and those killed and wounded in the attack and did not find any indication that any of those staying in the building were legitimate military attacks, uh, military targets, and thus rendering it a likely direct attack on civilians and civilian objects. And I'm just going to do one more airstrike and then we'll talk about the other types of weaponry. So this one occurred on April 19th of this year at 1015 at night. Um, this attack struck a four-story home of the Abu Radwan family in Tal Sultan, also in Rafah. Um, this attack killed nine family members, including six, ch six children, and injured five relatives. Uh, in this case, um, Amnesty identified the weapon used as an MPR-500, which is a 500-pound bomb made by the Israeli firm IMI. Um, also uh, uncovered were remnants of the bomb's precision guidance, guidance package, um, and the some of the components were identified as originating from uh, a U.S. manufacturer named Aero Antenna. So in this case, uh, we had U.S. made, or excuse me, Israeli-made munitions used, but at least some components of the guidance kit were identified as U.S. origin. Um, and likewise, in this attack, Amnesty was not able to identify a legitimate military target um, in the locations or among the individuals um, at the site. Now I'm going to quickly go through some of the examples we have with respect to tank attacks. Um, so specifically looking at 120 millimeter um, tank rounds. So we have one case, this one is from Southern Lebanon. This one occurred on October 13th, 2023. This was a double tap strike on a group of journalists who were working. They were clearly marked as press um, operating on a hill in an open area. And they were also um, very far from the, the cross-border fighting that was occurring that day. Um, <clears throat> among those, uh, so among the, the group, one journalist was killed. This was Reuters journalist Issam Abdullah. The other six were injured. Among the injured was AFP journalist Dylan Collins, um, an American citizen. Let's see. So just to quickly go through some of the details of the attack, for more than 40 minutes before the attack, an Israeli Ap Apache helicopter and likely an Israeli drone had hovered above them. So they would be would have been enough time for Israeli forces to identify them as clearly marked journalists. Um, so they were then struck twice by tank fire. Uh, and there was an investigation conducted in this case, not only by Amnesty International, but also Human Rights Watch, um, AFP and Reuters, which all came to the same conclusions and in all cases identified the use of 120 millimeter tank rounds. Um, in this case, the tank rounds were identified or um, excuse me, produced by Israeli IMI systems. Okay, let's see here. Um, and I'll just mention Dylan Collins, as I mentioned, was an American citizen, and he is calling for the Department of Justice to open investigation into this case, which amounted to a war crime. And I have another example of a tank attack from Gaza. This one's a bit more recent. This is from May of this year. So the Israeli military fired at least three tank shells at a location in the El Muasi area of Rafah. So this particular area had been designated as a humanitarian zone by Israeli authorities. In this particular attack, the strikes killed at least 23 civilians, including 12 children and injured many more. Amnesty's research found that in this particular attack, uh, that the apparent targets of the attack were one Hamas and one Islamic Jihad fighter. Um, however, despite the presence of the fighters, um, Amnesty concluded that the strike failed to distinguish between civilian and military objectives by using unguided munitions in an area full of civilians sheltering in tents. 
um, and therefore it is likely indiscriminate and should be investigated as a war crime. <clears throat> And of course, Amnesty has continued to underscore the responsibility of uh, armed groups to avoid, to the extent feasible, locating fighters in densely populated areas, uh, thereby endangering the lives of civilians. So in short, as I'd mentioned, this is not an exhaustive uh, um, overview of all of the cases Amnesty's investigated, but I think it does provide some illustrative examples of the overall pattern that has been extremely concerning, as well as the identification of US made munitions in specific attacks that have been unlawful. Um, and so in short, there is no shortage of evidence collected by Amnesty and other groups that illustrate the scale of unlawful attacks that have taken place by Israeli forces. And um, I think I will stop there. Thank you. Elizabeth, thank you so much. Uh, as usual, you've provided us with some super valuable information and more can be found on the Israel's misuse of these specific weapons that had been mentioned by Elizabeth via the white pa papers sent in the chat. Uh, they also cite and reference some of uh, Amnesty's crucial um, research. So thank you so much, Elizabeth. Uh, and next we'll hear from John Reming Chapel, advisor on legal and policy issues in civics US program, where he engages with US policymakers and advocates to enhance the protection of civilians in conflict. His work focuses on US law and policy related to civilian harm, arms sales and security assistance. John regularly writes for leading policy publications and his commentary has appeared in the New York Times, CNN, NPR, Politico and other media outlets. Prior to joining Civic, John worked at think tanks and foreign policy advocacy organizations. John, thank you so much for being here today. Um, and could I ask you to provide some more context on the specific weapons in question uh, and, and you know, which bills are targeting which weapons and describe how they have been used by the Israeli military in ways that may have violated US laws and policies. And also kind of what do staffers need to know as their offices consider supporting the JRDs about the impact on Biden's lame duck presidency, um, President-elect Trump, and Netanyahu's uh, prosecution of the war. Yeah, thank you so much, Adelia, and thank you all for being here. Um, I'm a lawyer. I focus on U.S. law and policy related to arms transfers, and so I'm going to try to fit the joint resolutions of disapproval into the context of some of the legal and policy frameworks um, which are which are abundant um, to start off. Uh, so some examples are that um, the Biden administration's conventional arms transfer policy prohibits the transfer of weapons where it's more likely than not that they'll be used to facilitate uh, serious violations of international human rights or humanitarian law. Uh, there is also a National Security Memorandum 20, which many of you have probably followed, that required the uh, Israeli government, among other governments, to provide credible, written, uh, written, credible and reliable assurances that it would uh, use U.S. weapons in compliance with international law and would facilitate humanitarian access. There's also legal frameworks like the Leahy Law, which prohibits uh, security assistance to units of foreign security forces that have where there's credible information they have committed a gross violation of human rights. Section 502B of the Foreign Assistance Act prohibits uh, arms transfers to uh, countries where that government uh, has engaged in a consistent pattern of gross violations of human rights. Uh, and then, of course, the Arms Export Control Act. And um, that's really where we come to joint resolutions of disapproval, because ever since the mid-1970s, the uh, Congress has had a way to uh, receive notifications of major arms sales that, that exceed a certain value threshold, uh, and then to pass resolutions in order to suspend uh, the, those uh, arms sales from proceeding. Um, and so since the mid-1970s, certain resolutions of disapproval have been a pretty standard oversight tool for Congress. Um, they were used extensively uh, in the context of uh, the U.S.-supported and Saudi and Emirati-led war in Yemen. They've been used uh, in the context of U.S. Uh, assistance to Egypt. Um, and uh, they have not thus far, uh, there has not been a direct vote um, on a joint resolution of disapproval for arms sales to Israel. 
Uh, but as I said, it's a relatively standard um, tool in the congressional toolbox when it comes to using its constitutional authority uh, over um, arms sales. Um, and so what we're looking at here is six joint resolutions of disapproval. Each one uh, is corresponding to a different sale. Um, and so the bill numbers here are SJ Res 111, 112, 113, 114, 115, and 116. And as I mentioned, each one of them corresponds to a different type of weapon that is being sold. And so in 111, we have 120 millimeter tank shells and 112 uh, tactical vehicles and 113 uh, mortar cartridges and 114 F-15s and 115 joint direct attack munitions and 116 enhanced uh, receivers for joint direct attack munitions. Um, and so we could see votes um, likely next week on one or more of these resolutions. Um, and I, I think that many of the offices in the Senate that are called to vote on this, and there is going to be a vote in the Senate, partly because um, of the application of uh, privilege procedures that allow for a member of the Senate to force a vote. Um, those procedures aren't uh, available in the House when it comes to this specific mechanism. But part of the calculation for different offices, I think, is going to be related to what specifically the weapons in each of these sales do and what concerns they raise. And so th there are different ways that different people have approached these sales. Um, some, some people are going to primarily come at them with the perspective of offensive versus defensive weapons. And that's uh, it's hard to say categorically that any weapon is solely offensive or defensive. And a lot of uh, it comes down to context uh, for how we're seeing them used in operations. Um, but I would say that uh, in terms of making that decision, it's useful to look at uh, Amnesty International's research and to look at uh, how and when uh, the weapons in question have been used uh, in Gaza and in Lebanon and elsewhere. Some are, uh, will also come at this from the perspective of lethal versus non-lethal equipment. Uh, and so they might say that, um, for example, tactical vehicles are not lethal, whereas the other uh, five sales are. Um, and another framework that you can approach this at is the risk of use in international humanitarian law violations. And this is the framework that is, I'd say, most firmly rooted in international law, um, like there, and also, frankly, most firmly rooted in US policy due to the conventional arms transfer policy and the standards that it uses. Um, so I wanted to lay out some of those different frameworks and how you might be thinking about uh, where particular uh, sales fall. Um, and that will inform, I'm sure, the ways that uh, folks are going to vote um, next week. The other thing that I wanted to talk about a little bit is uh, another legal uh, and policy process that um, I mentioned up top, but we'll go into a bit more depth on, it's especially relevant uh, today and tomorrow, um, which is uh, National Security Memorandum 20. So as I mentioned, National Security Memorandum 20 requires uh, governments that receive US funded, US origin weapons to provide these assurances. Uh, and the assurances cover international law compliance and also facilitation of humanitarian aid. Um, there's a process uh, in National Security Memorandum 20 by which uh, the secretaries of defense or state can call into question the credibility and reliability of assurances. And that triggers a process of uh, considering whether the country in question remains eligible to receive US assistance. Now, 30 days ago, maybe 29 days ago, um, the uh, Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense, Blinken Austin, uh, wrote a letter to the Israeli government um, essentially saying that there could be consequences for U.S. arms sales uh, if certain benchmarks are not met when it comes to humanitarian aid. Um, and they referenced U.S. law, and the relevant statute is Section 620I of the Foreign Assistance Act, which... Um, uh, prohibits U.S. military aid to uh, countries that prohibit or otherwise restrict the delivery of U.S. humanitarian aid. Um, I hope that I said that right. Sometimes I say humanitarian aid twice, but I meant military aid or arms sales, and it's conditioned on humanitarian access. So just this morning, 
um, some of the world's leading humanitarian organizations, groups that are active in Gaza, uh, Oxfam, Save the Children, Mercy Corps, uh, the Norwegian Refugee Council came out with a scorecard, um, a scorecard that takes the conditions that were laid out in the letter uh, and finds that not only uh, did the Israeli government not meet these conditions, but in fact, it has taken actions that have made uh, the situation for civilians in Gaza even worse during these last 30 days. Um, I think that that is something that everyone should have in mind uh, as they are uh, deciding uh, how to vote on these resolutions next week, because we see an opportunity here, uh, really the last opportunity of this administration uh, to push to uh, stand up for civilians in Gaza, to um, push for the enforcement of U.S. law. Uh, and it's a very crucial time um, as we are heading into a new administration. So I will end there and turn it back to you, Odilia. Thank you so much. John, as usual, thank you so much for uh, this um, comprehensive overview and just wanted to flag that in the chat, the bill numbers and which um, weapons they implicate are listed. Uh, and next we'll hear from Josh Paul, director at A New Policy and a non-resident fellow at the organization Democracy for the Arab World Now, or DAWN. Josh resigned from the State Department in October 2023 due to his disagreement with the Biden administration's decision to rush lethal military assistance to Israel in the context of its war on Gaza. He'd previously spent over 11 years working as a director in the Bureau of Political Military Affairs, which is responsible for U.S. defense diplomacy, security assistance, and arms transfers. He previously worked on security sector reform in both Iraq and the West Bank, with additional roles in the Office of the Secretary of Defense, U.S. Army staff, and as a military legislative assistant for a member of the U.S. House Armed Services Committee. Josh, uh, thank you for being here with us today. I wanted to ask a couple of questions. Um, first, if you could provide some historical context about U.S. military support and weapon sales to the government of Israel, and if stopping the flow of these weapons uh, would put at risk Israeli or U.S. national security interests. Also, I'd like to ask how this might impact the stated U.S. objectives in the region, such as a ceasefire, regional de-escalation, and, and now, you know, uh, stated most recently in the Austin Blinken letter, a flow of humanitarian aid into Gaza. Yeah, thanks, Ojilia. Uh, really glad to be with you and with you all, uh, particularly as this is a new policy's first group. Uh, briefing for congressional staff. Um, and so uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, we are a new C4 uh, looking at aligning American policy towards the Middle East with American interests. Uh, so let me let me get to each of those questions. Uh, I think, you know, especially, you know, it's good to be with you all in discussing this uh, from the other side of the table, having been on the other side of many joint resolutions of disapproval uh, during my time at the State Department in the Bureau of Political Military Affairs, which of course manages uh, the arms transfer process. Um, just a couple of observations, if I can, at the top. The first is, I think it's important to remember, particularly for uh, those of you calling in from the Senate, uh, that a joint resolution by itself, uh, the existence of a joint resolution disapproval, uh, is a failure of process. Uh, there is, you know, a requirement in law for major arms transfers to be notified to Congress, but there has been since the 1970s, a, an informal process now called the tiered review process between the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and the executive branch that is specifically designed and that is there uh, so that concerns about potential major arms sales can be hashed out uh, in private before cases are formally notified. Uh, that is, as many of you know, a uh, closed process that is guarded very jealously uh, by the chairs and rankings on Senate Foreign Relations and on House Foreign Affairs Committees. Um, and so I think I would say, first of all, that, you know, support for a joint resolution of disapproval on the floor is, amongst other things, uh, a message to uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee and House Foreign Affairs Committee leadership, a, a reminder um, that there are other voices that they need to be listening to, that other senators, other members have equities here. Uh, and need to be consulted and to be as they need to be as inclusive as possible uh, as they consider proposed transfers. 
Uh, and in fact, um, previous joint resolutions of disapproval, for example, on Egypt, have led to a widening of that circle. For example, on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, um, a few years ago, after there was a JRD against the case to Egypt, uh, HVAC leadership uh, did make it a case, a practice uh, of reaching out to concerned members to make sure they were consulted so that we did not get to the point where a case came to the floor and was, uh, you know, a joint resolution disapproval was offered against it. This is also, uh, you know, in that context, uh, fundamentally, a vote on a JRD is a reassertion of congressional oversight prerogatives. The arms transfer authorization process, as John just described, was specifically designed and is specifically designed in the Arms Export Control Act as a dual key system, right? If you think about those nuclear bunkers where you don't just want one person turning the key to send that, that ballistic missile flying, uh, it's the same for arms transfer, uh, and there is congressional co-determination. Uh, in the wake of Charter in the 1980s, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee specifically argued that the JRD process and the potential presidential veto uh, that it, it could lead to uh, is unseverable from the underlying statute. Uh, so this is a key part of the process by design and is also an opportunity uh, to assert congressional oversight of foreign relations, You know, particularly at a time where, for example, Congress is not keen to act in the war powers space. Uh, this is a way to show that Congress is still active and relevant uh, in the context of executive branch national security decision making. I'll also say, based on my time at State, uh, that the executive branch does not like JRDs. Uh, they, as I said, the whole point of the tiered review process is to avoid them. Uh, and when JRDs begin to crop up for a country, that does factor into the internal policy making discussions uh, as new cases are being considered and, frankly, as diplomatic conversations are being conducted with the country in question. Uh, it forces state to sort of raise these issues in the context of those conversations. In fact, a lot of the time, uh, it forces the country uh, to raise those issues and to ask what they can do to avoid uh, joint resolution of, dis of disapproval. Uh, and so it makes state think harder about those concerns. Uh, another thing it does for internal policy making, of course, is once you have a joint resolution of disapproval, um, the White House will almost always, if not always, uh, issue a statement of administration policy, a SAP, uh, you know, stating typically that the administration opposes the joint resolution of disapproval. Uh, and so it, it first of all makes them lay out explicitly their their rationale for why they oppose the JRD, why they support the arms transfer, uh, which I think is also particularly helpful right now, uh, as, you know, there has been a dearth of internal policy discussion within the administration over the course of the last year, where we've seen you know, the presidential guidance, the Secretary of State guidance is moved forward. Uh, you know, don't ask any questions, you know, authorize, you know, everything that, that Israel comes in requesting, regardless of how it's being used on the ground. And so simply the process of generating a SAP uh, requires that sort of discussion and debate that has been missing, uh, including from the Human Rights Bureau, DRL, uh, and others uh, who will have to chime in. And then final sort of framing comment on, on JRDs writ large, uh, is that this is also, of course, a means of spotlighting arms transfers in particular. And the incoming administration, Trump administration, uh, will make arms transfers a key part of its diplomacy, uh, as they did the first time around, right, on on many bases, including, um, you know, this sort of focus on, on security diplomacy as a key element. Uh, and I'm sure that there are going to be many conversations uh, about arms transfers in the public sphere uh, and between Congress and the executive branch in the coming years. So I think this is also a good scene setter for that conversation. Uh, this conversation, this brings arms transfers into the spotlight ahead of that period. Uh, and so that says that, look, when we when we are concerned about arms transfers, it is not because of who is in office. This is not a simple political move. Uh, this is something that we are concerned about because of the substance, because of the potential harm to civilian life, because of the implications for US and international law. Uh, so I think that this is a helpful conversation to be having now, regardless. Um, turning to these specific JRDs. Uh, so first of all, let's be clear, uh, a joint resolution of disapproval uh, against Israel is not going to pass both houses with a supermajority, with the two-thirds majority necessary to overcome uh, a potential presidential veto. That's OK. Uh, no joint resolution of disapproval against any arms sale to any country uh, has ever passed both houses with that required supermajority. Uh, but obviously, many of the members, the senators who are whose staff are represented on this call, have voted for them in the past, knowing that. 
uh, in a bipartisan fashion, right? Uh, looking at, for example, the 2019 tranche of joint resolutions of disapproval against arms sales to the Saudi-led coalition in Yemen, of which the Senate passed, I believe, 27 of those um, as a means of expressing concern on the sales and driving this conversation. Um, and, you know, there's also, I should note, an ongoing conversation within the executive branch about the implications should a JRD ever pass after a contract or a letter of offer and acceptance has been issued. Uh, and I think it's probably helpful also to keep that conversation going uh, within the executive branch. Again, it's that, that congressional co-determination. Uh, that said, uh, just briefly adding to a few points that uh, John had made just now, uh, there are some specific arguments that you will probably encounter from the administration uh, that I think are worth briefly discussing. Uh, and, and you know, part of the reason I expect these is that these are some of the arguments the administration has made before. Uh, one, of course, is Israel's own defense requirements and its right to defend itself. Uh, I think we need to be, first of all, aware, of course, that Israel does have significant existing stockpiles, even though they are stretched. Of course, the United States also has uh, significant stretched stockpiles right now. And I think we need to ask, you know, in the context of Israel and Ukraine about our own defense capabilities and why those are not the priority, uh, particularly given that some of the capabilities here are in demand in U.S. stockpiles and are running low here as a result of, of providing them. Uh, as John said as well, these votes also create the space for the administration uh, to lean in on some of these issues about humanitarian assistance to make the case of, look, we don't have an entirely free hand. There are increasing pressures here. Uh, so let's address those. Of course, these also don't include, quote unquote, defensive systems. Uh, as John said, for example, the senators specifically decided not to include uh, AMRAAD missiles, air-to-air -air missiles that can shoot down incoming drones as a defensive system. And of course, as well, uh, should more than one joint resolution of disapproval be called up on the floor, senators do not have to vote the same way on every resolution. Uh, you can vote you know, one way on a system you think has a particular threat to, for example, civilian harm, uh, and vote you know, another way on, on a different case. Uh, another argument you will hear likely is that of precision uh that look you know you, you keep telling us you want israel to be more precise and less civilian harm and here you are you know for example on the jdam case uh voting against that capability uh i think the issue we have here as very similarly we had in the saudi-led coalition in yemen is not ultimately one of capability uh certainly in the israel case is not one of capability but is one of intent uh, we've seen, you know, these reports on the use of AI to uh, develop targeting. Uh, we've seen this intensive international law debate on discrimination and proportionality. Uh, precision is not the issue when it comes to civilian harm over the course of the last year. Uh, it is what level of civilian harm is, is Israel willing to accept to pursue its, its uh, objectives, or even uh, what level of civilian harm is it willing to inflict. Um, two more arguments you might hear from the administration. One is cost and industry, uh, you know, particularly on things like the tank shells. You might hear that, well, this is a bulk buy. Uh, this gets packaged with a, a sale that the army is going to buy. If we don't move forward on this, the price includes, increases for everyone, uh, including the U.S. Army. I think, first of all, uh, this is, as we've just said, going to go forward. You know, I think, you know, this, this likelihood of this vote blocking it is, is extremely low. Um, but second, I think that the cost, you know, any slightly increased cost to the army, first of all, can be offset because there are plenty of other partners buying tank shells. Uh, and second of all, of course, the cost of the United States uh, of going through, going forward with this continued unconditional support is, I, I think, much higher than the, in, you know, the, the incremental increased cost to the U.S. Army. And then the final argument I want to touch on from the administration uh, is that of reliable security partnership, right? Uh, you know, we've got to show that the U.S. is there for our partners and our allies. Uh, if countries are afraid that they will be in a crisis and not afraid and not able to get material from us, uh, they'll turn to Russia or China. Um, you know, first, I, I don't you know, that's not how it works. Uh, a country like Israel, whose military is, you know, 90 percent U.S. tech or co-developed tech uh, and sort of between 70 to 80 percent U.S. content um, is not going to suddenly turn and given the relationship to Russia or China. But look, our, our partnerships always come with strings, right? And whether that be end use monitoring, whether it be a requirement to comply with international law, uh, that along with the quality of our weaponry uh, and the relationship that those sales bring to the country with the US is precisely what differentiates us 
from our competition. Um, the suggestion that we're going to provide arms regardless of how they are used undercuts uh, a great significant part of that US reliability in terms of our brand. Uh, and it also undercuts one of our key arguments about the entire purpose of partnering with the US. Uh, and if it is the case that we are a reliable security partner who will provide weapons regardless of how they are used, and I don't think that is the case, but if that is the case, it's incumbent on the administration to do its homework and to get Congress on board before it formally notifies a case. Uh, so again, if Congress is to have a role in that reliable security partnership as a co-equal branch of government, uh, that is why you know demonstrating uh, that there is support for a JRD is important. Uh, and then the very final thing I want to touch on here is, you know, you may also get some arguments from leadership on, first of all, the politics and optics of non-unified support for Israel. Um, and there, you know, I think we've discussed a lot of those points. Um, but again, this is also about, um, you know, the, the importance of the U.S. brand, of pursuing U.S. interests around the world. Uh, and I think of of integrating some of the lessons, frankly, of the last couple of weeks uh, and beginning a very important conversation with the American people about uh, you know, our foreign policies. Uh, and again, this also sends a message to Israel as they look forward and begin to think about, for example, uh, the 2026 midterms, uh, about how they should act if they want to have that continued US guarantee, that continued US support. Uh, this is all part of that bigger question. And it's a conversation that I think uh, these resolutions will begin uh, and open the door for. Uh, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Josh. Uh, as always, very valuable and helpful information. And thank you all for your uh, in-depth answers to previous questions. I wanna to move to the Q&A section and address questions asked by staffers prior to the briefing today. Notice you can also use the Q&A function in the Zoom uh, to ask further questions. But one question that was asked, you touched upon a bit earlier, I think this kind of talks a bit more on the specifics of these weapons. Um, could So could these weapon systems, including the 120 millimeter tank shells and JDAMs, also be used for defensive operations to take out Hamas and Hezbollah missile launchers uh, used to attack Israel? So Josh, um, I'll let you start and then we'll hear from John as well. Sure, thank you. Um, I mean, first of all, on that specific example, I think that's unlikely, right? You're not going to get uh, typically close enough to a missile launcher to use a, a tank shell. Um, but uh, but more broadly, you know, look, so the State Department doesn't use a, a differentiation of offensive versus defensive uh, precisely because, um, you know, it depends on how it is being used. And what we would need to talk about here is what Elizabeth laid out in the beginning, which is how these weapons are being used. Uh, when we look at the incredible amount of civilian harm in Gaza, uh, in Lebanon in the last couple of, in the last month, uh, and the indiscriminate use of this weapon, this is sending a message, not that you don't have a right to defend yourself. In fact, again, some of these more defensive systems are just not being touched here in the JRDs, but that how you do it matters. Uh, and I think that's the key takeaway here. John, would you like to add anything? It just covered it very well. I, I think that the one thing that I would add is that when it comes to any of these big distinctions when, uh, around arms, so offensive, defensive, lethal, non-lethal, and then the question of risk of use and violations of international law, it's possible to get yourself into a corner in terms of thought experiments, in terms of what ifs, in terms of scenarios. And I would my urge to you would just be to look at the evidence of what we have seen actually happen on the ground in the last year and a month. Um, and that that is uh, the place where you're going to see um, how the weapons have been used and what the consequences have been for Palestinian civilians in Gaza. Thank you, John. And uh, yeah, so to speak further on the evidence gathered, I wanted to ask Elizabeth um, how information on the ground is gathered and research carried out on the use of these weapons and the human cost of their use in Gaza. Uh, you shared earlier about your employee on the ground, so it would be good to know a bit more into detail of how this information is gathered and documented. Sure. Um, I think I could give uh, kind of a brief overview of some details. I mean, our investigations uh, involve an, a range of activities. Um, we certainly have our field worker on the ground who's doing that, you know, 
He's visiting the sites, taking photos, uh, speaking to to survivors or those uh, that witnessed the the strike. So that's part of the work. But our teams also they analyze satellite imagery. Uh, they do desk research. Um, they do a wide range of activities. They also, of course, conduct uh, proportionality analysis. So there's a lot of work that goes into it and a number of, of and te teams that have really done incredible work that have brought, you know, brought Amnesty's um, um, research to fruition. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, and then I just I kind of want to open this question to everyone. Uh, have you or humanitarian colleagues seen cases where leveraging U.S. military aid was able to bolster diplomacy, humanitarian aid access, and advance human rights law, uh, you know, like is desperately needed right now in Gaza? Um, Josh, can I turn it to you first? Sure. Uh, yes. Right. So, so the whole purpose of military assistance and security assistance, the reason why it is those authorities are vested in the State Department, is because they are a tool of foreign policy. And by being in the hands of the State Department and the US ambassador in country, uh, they, first of all, enable those conversations to happen uh, in a way that wouldn't happen if they were vested in you know, the Defense Department or the combatant commander, uh, because those conversations are you know, also vested in, in the State Department and, and the uh, ambassador. Uh, and yes, there are also ex examples in which that has very much happened, right? And so um, you know, it is never a perfect process, but one example, would be, well, first of all, right, the Biden administration's first thing that it did upon coming into office was suspend certain arms transfers of, of precision guided munitions to the Saudi-led coalition. Um, and at the same time, deployed Tim Lenderking as the US uh, special envoy on, Lemon, on Yemen to be able to draw a close to that conflict to address some of the humanitarian issues. And, and those two things functioned as a package. Uh, it was in part the leverage from our security relationship, our defense relationship, uh, that got doors open for Tim and got people listening to him. Uh, another example, and again, imperfect, uh, but is Nigeria, uh, where, you know, the U.S. provided Super Tucano A-29 fighter jets, um, but as a part of that process, engaged in a very in-depth conversation, particularly with the Nigerian Air Force, uh, but also with other sectors of the Nigerian government about conflict resolution, about humanitarian assistance, and about civilian harm. Of course, that's the, the most direct bit. So yes, these conversations do happen in parallel and using security assistance and arms transfers as a, a an opportunity to start those conversations is common practice. Thank you. And I, I want to turn it to John, considering your work on the Saudi Yemen uh, uh, example, if you, if you can um, elaborate further on this question. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that this is a really important and recent example of how congressional oversight, including through joint resolutions of dis disapproval, um, sent a very clear message uh, to what was then the incoming Biden administration that there had to be a change in policy. Um, you saw even former Biden administration officials um, coming out to say that uh, they uh, regretted what had happened in uh, Yemen using U.S. weapons and um favored further restrictions and so we saw uh the biden administration as josh said come into office and immediately restrict um, offensive uh weapons transfers to saudi arabia um we've just seen uh a reversal of that policy in the last couple of months um and there i think uh, i know that amnesty fcnl and civic have all taken positions on that decision um but it is uh, fair to say that Yemen is, a, is in a very different place in terms of the Saudi and Emirati bombing campaign relative to where it was. Um, I'd also just say that restrictions on arms transfers are very normal. They are, they're a standard thing in U.S. policy. They go back uh, more than a century, um, whether it is uh, arms embargo during the Mexican-American War or the Trading with the Enemy Act during World War I. Uh, many restrictions on arms to uh, Chile um, during the um, so-called human rights revolution of the 1970s. Um, these are uh, not a new tool <laughs> and uh, they uh, should absolutely be uh, on the table and part of the conversation when it comes to US arms transfers to Israel as they have been in the past. <laughs> 
including um, when uh, the Israeli government used cluster munitions in Lebanon during uh, the 1982 invasion. So um, a few thoughts there. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, and John, I do have a question I think you could answer as well uh, from, you know, we've received this in multiple variations from staffers, but how do the changes in the upcoming administration potentially impact arms sales? Um, so, you know, you've touched upon this a bit, but uh, perhaps you could expand a bit further. I am actually going to turn that over to Josh. And I think Josh also noticed a question that he thought would be good to cover in the chat. And so, um, Josh, over to you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. I mean, I think just briefly again, I think, first of all, this lays down a essentially a nonpartisan marker uh, that Congress is engaged, is interested in arms transfers and will speak up where there are concerns. And I, I think that does help uh, in the incoming administration context where there again, there is going to be a significant context on arms transfers as a tool, both of foreign policy and American manufacturing. Uh, and I think a, a good faith demonstration that this is not simply about pushing back on that administration. This is about values and American interests uh, that transcend any administration uh, is an important point. It does also, you know, lay down a marker for those more political discussions, uh, both, you know, within the incoming administration about foreign policy uh, and uh, within, I think, those on the Hill about, you know, how people want to be thinking about positioning themselves in the context of uh, the upcoming political cycle, given the cycle that we just emerged from. Yeah, thank you, Josh. And another question we've received in the chat um, kind of touches upon what we, you know, asking what do we think that the administration or the Israeli government would say about these weapon systems vis-a-vis -vis a conflict with Iran? Uh, as I've got an open mic, perhaps I'll take a first stab there, right? Uh, so just very quickly, First of all, most of the systems we're talking about are not relevant in that context, right? If we are talking about the use of mortars in a war between Israel and Iran, something has gone very, very, very wrong in a way that we have not seen. Um, you know, so there are two systems here. One is the F-15 sale. Um, those are not going to be delivered until 2029. Um, there is absolutely no harm in having a discussion now, given the context in which fighter jets have been used uh, in Gaza, in Lebanon, uh, in particular, about, you know, whether those tools, you know, uh, having a conversation about the relevance of those tools to civilian harm, to target selection, to international humanitarian law. Um, likewise, uh, JDAMs, Joint Direct Attack Munitions, first of all, if you look at the recent Israeli strikes on Iran, those were conducted mostly uh, with air-launched ballistic missiles, air-launched cruise missiles. There's a reason for that. Uh, it's a long way from Israel to Iran. Uh, and there isn't, once you've flown out there, an awful lot of hover time uh, to fly around in circles and get your target right and get out to targets, never mind, you know, out further west. And so there aren't a lot of use cases for JDAMs uh, in that type of conflict, given those logistical complications and, and requirements. But again, these are also the weapons that are being used now uh, in the Gaza context, in the Lebanon context, to result in significant civilian and humanitarian harm. And I think that the American people and certainly the executive branch and the Israelis, for that matter, uh, are more than capable of understanding the nuance between a, a defensive conflict uh, and their current use and the point that is being made. Thank you, Josh. Um, I do want to ask kind of all of you a final question from a uh, staffer on this call, uh, asking what are the implications of further U.S. arms sales to Israel in terms of enabling the Israeli government to utilize more of its own domestic budget on things like the subsidization of settler expansion throughout the West Bank. Um, John, I see you nodding, so I'll pass it to you. Sure, I'll go first and I'll turn it over to Elizabeth. Um, I, I think that I'll, I'll approach this question uh, in a couple of ways. One is that this um, rightfully recognizes that uh, money is fungible. Um, and, you know, we have been talking about arms transfers here, but when we haven't been talking as much about the fact that they are arms transfers that are also paid for by U.S. taxpayers. Um, and so uh, that has a lot of influence um, and effect on the Israeli government's um, ability to do other things, even if they are not uh, directly associated with the specific weapons in question. 
The other thing I want to bring up here is political signaling, which I think is very important when it comes to arms transfers and something that we haven't talked quite as much about as we've been more focused on the specific weapons and what they do, um, which is that arms transfers are a signal of political support. Um, and uh, it is hard to get around that. Um, that is why a, a much of the uh, framework um, around human rights and security assistance exists because um, legislators uh, from the 70s until the 90s and now uh, were concerned about uh, the message that was being sent uh, by US weapons going to human rights abusers um, and war criminals. Um, that should also be a part of the equation as folks are considering how to vote and for the specifics on um, the West Bank, I'm going to hand it over to Elizabeth. Thanks, John. Um, I think I'll start by saying I'm I'm not an expert in the, the Israeli government's budget, but I do think um, what we can say that's very clear as that the uh, assistance and protection provided by the U.S. government has made the occupation sustainable. Um, you know, today we've really been focusing focusing on military attacks with respect to Gaza, and that's certainly um, a significant part of the picture. But we're also, you know, there's so there's a wide range of uh, violations of international humanitarian law and human rights law that are taking place as well within this context. Whether we're talking about the expansion of illegal settlements the demolition of homes in the West Bank, um, state-backed settler attacks that have continued to occur and have escalated in the last uh, about year or so period. And they had already been on a, on a up, uptick of escalation even prior to that. The systematic use of torture and other ill treatment in detention centers. These are of course centers where Palestinians both from the West Bank and now Gaza have been held. Um, the denial of, of medical care within these, these uh, imprisonment contexts as well. Um, Right, and that's just that's just touching on on some of it. There's there's certainly more to talk about, but the massive amounts of military aid, and not only just the physical weapons, but the training, right, all of the other kinds of, of assistance that the U.S. government provides helps to keep this system sustainable. So I think I would underscore that importance. And then number two, I think the other important aspect of this is right, the evidence of violations is quite frankly overwhelming. And so this is a situation where continuing to provide weapons into this context puts the U.S. at an extreme risk of complicity in violations that will, once they, once they know, right, once they, and we've been very clear, their violations are ongoing. So the U.S. is on notice. And to continue to provide weapons into this context, the risk of complicity is extremely, extremely high. And I don't think I can underscore that enough. So I think the, the, the flip side to this is also ensuring that the U.S. government is no longer uh, assisting or providing material that can be used in violations. So just making sure that the U.S. is right where it should be with respect to both U.S. law and international law. And I'll pass to, I guess, Josh, if you have anything, or back to Odelia. I don't know. Josh, would you like to add anything? No, no. I think okay. that, that covers it. Yeah, I you know I just want to say it's been a great discussion. Seems like uh, there are more questions. People are curious to learn more. Um, so thank you all for sharing your timely insights. And I'd like to ask each panelist to share sixty second closing words. Uh, so first, let's hear from Elizabeth. Thank you, Odelia. Um, I mean, I think it's obvious to say that that what we've all witnessed over the last year has certainly been horrific, um, gut wrenching. The evidence that Amnesty and others have collected have been quite clear about the violations that we're seeing. Um, I, I did see a question in the chat asking about statements, like statements from the Israeli government and soldiers. And I think statements are important, but I think what's more important is actions. And the evidence that have stemmed from Israeli forces actions have been really clear. And so I think for my final thought, final statement for today, I would just underscore very heavily how important it is for all Senate offices to vote in favor of these joint resolutions of disapproval when they come to the floor towards ensuring not only compliance with international law, but critically um, a, a step towards seeing the implementation of US law in this context. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, so much. And uh, turning it over to you, John. Sure, there's a, there's a lot that could be said. I'll try to keep it as short as possible. 
This is a vote to uphold the rule of law. It is a vote to uh, stand up finally uh, for civilians in Gaza. Um, and it's a vote to reset expectations because I'm afraid that far too much has gone without opposition in this last year. Uh, far too much uh, has been delayed. Too many excuses have been made. This is an incredibly important and nonpartisan statement uh, that it, this vote is, um, that the status quo is unacceptable and it's unsustainable. Um, and so I think that that is what folks should be keeping in mind as they are writing their memos and talking to their boss. Thank you, John. And go ahead, Josh. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just briefly, and, and to John's last point there, right, I mean, one of the things we haven't talked about a lot in this conversation, although we've touched on it, is American interests. Uh, and of course, there has been an immense amount of harm done to our credibility and our alliances around the world because we haven't been having these conversations uh, about what we should be doing, what we should be providing, where we should be asking questions uh, and drawing lines. Uh, the other point I would make in closing, of course, is that this is not only, again, about, about American interests, it is also about congressional interests, uh, congressional prerogatives uh, within the tier review process and the arms transfer process, congressional prerogatives as regards the executive branch, uh, as well as the voices of members of Congress uh, and the Senate uh, in this process and towards their own leadership. Uh, and it is also about, uh, you know, this co-determination that exists and framing a debate that is only going to continue. And I think the more we do of that now, uh, the easier, although they'll still be hard, things will be down the road. So for all of those reasons, I, I would just encourage, you know, those of you who are on the line who are working for your senators uh, to please encourage them uh, to support these joint resolutions of disagreement. Yeah, thank you. Great final word. And um, thank you again so much to our panelists for coming to speak with us. And thank you all uh, who, who have joined us today for coming. Uh, please keep an eye out for a follow-up email with the recording of this briefing, a couple resources and invites to future events in the series. And if you have any follow-up questions for the panelists, uh, feel free to email Kavan, that's spelled C-A-V-A-N, Kavan at demandprogress.org. Um, you know, we appreciate you showing up and hope to see you again next briefing.